morning with your loving kindness, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm us with the works of our hands. Yes, confirm the works of our hands. I'm glad you're you know, the terrible thing is I remembered who moved that chair this morning. It was me uh, after our prayer time this morning uh, that we had before service. And then I forgot it. <laughs> so on our missionary spotlight today, we've got uh, our first missionary, our first time um, praying for this missionary as a missionary couple. And we've got their, um, hopefully we'll have their picture up here, the Bogners, Mark and Autumn. Uh, they sent out a picture here. They have a whole briefing, the Bogner briefing, so to speak, uh, that is uh, over on the table there. We got a couple of new um, uh, missionary prayer letters this month. Um, so, um, but I think the Bogner briefing might be the only one that's printed up so far. The other ones came in this morning and I didn't get to them, but... They were married last month, uh, so they've been married almost a month, I think a month on Tuesday. Um, so many of you we know we've been praying for Mark for a while and known Mark for a while. They are in Dallas right now, and they're living there, waiting there until they go for some further training as a married couple uh, in Missouri. Uh, I believe they hope to start that in August. Uh, because it is different going into ministry when you're single or when you're married. So they're having to do some of those things over again. I don't know if that will mean that we'll get to see them here uh, again before they are off to Papua New Guinea. But just uh, the prayer for them is just that they will continue and begin to learn how to do life and ministry together because it's different. And no matter how many times... You hear that, know that before you're married, you don't actually know it until you're in it. So uh, we'll just take and be praying for Mark and for Autumn. Lord, we just uh, praise you and thank you for Mark and for Autumn, Lord, as they are beginning this journey of life and of ministry together, Lord. I pray that you would just bless their... Um, Bless their time together, their life and their walk, even as they, well, for Mark, redo some training, but as they, they see it as training now together, and the two of them as they move forward. I just pray for the, these things in your name. Amen. Our second um, village, our, our second missionary is a village missionary couple. Uh, it's interesting, Kevin mentioned the, the nothingness between uh, Phoenix and Flagstaff. Um, this is a um, uh, Jake and Kathleen Licklider there in Mare, which is to the left as you're going up that there, most of the way to Prescott, but not all the way. Um, and just got uh, an update from them. It's not in the bulletin but they actually just texted an update this morning. Um, <clears throat> they have a lot of sickness going through their uh, church right now, cold and flu. And, of course, they're a small church, kind of like us, so when it starts to go through, it starts to go through. Um, so they just pray for all the people in their church there. And also, this is a, to me, this would be a very important thing, um, They've got a septic issue with the parsonage this, that they're hoping to get fixed this week. That can be, I mean, they're a family of five there, and if the septic's not working, um, I don't know what, it's kind of cold to take and go outside and put out an outhouse, but um, in any event, we'll just take and continue to play for the, the Licklider family there in there. Lord, as we think of the Licklighters and the church there in Mare. Um, that you would 
give um, just your grace and your mercy on them, on that church, as there's so much of this flu and this sickness coming through, Lord, that you would take and um, again bring them through this, Lord. Even for these things, the the septic system, Lord, I would just pray that the issues would be able to be resolved, Lord, so that they can focus on the ministry that they would like to do. Lord, we pray these things in your name. Amen. As we come before the Lord this day, as we continue through the book of First Peter, we come to a very wonderful text, sometimes a confusing text that really begins to speak about the timeless gospel of our Lord and the timelessness of the gospel. We think of so many different things and we try to find something that is timeless leave the marketing, you know, diamonds are forever, except we know that they weren't diamonds at one point, and at some point they will eventually degrade into something else. And those are the hardest, most lasting substance we can think of, and yet even they aren't really timeless. We certainly know that fashion and foods, and everything else, nothing is truly timeless. And yet here we come to a passage about the timelessness of the gospel. And as has been the case in several times in First Peter, when I come up to a passage and I'm like, wow, that's going to be hard to really, truly unravel. And the more that I'm working through in First Peter, um, <clears throat> the more I have to laugh about the statement that the book of Peter made about Paul, who said things hard to understand. Um, I think the pot may have called the kettle black a little bit here. This particular passage, beginning in uh, the 18th verse of chapter 3 was called by uh, Martin Luther, a wonderful text, and is this, and a more obscure passage than any other in the New Testament, so that I do not know just what Peter means. <clears throat> and while there's been a lot more study and a lot more prayerful thought through this passage since the time of Martin Luther. It's still one that are, has many different understandings of this passage. And I'm going to be working through one of those that I think fits the context best. But this is not the only way that people think of this. But before we get into that, let's begin by reading this passage, beginning in verse 18. It says, For Christ also died for sins, once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who, were want, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God having, God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. 
I'm going to stop there for the moment because we haven't even gotten to the therefore that begins chapter 4. And we can see why this passage is a passage that many have wondered about. Because it begins off very easily to understand. A passage that many may even have heard and understood. Maybe even memorized at one point in time. For Christ also died for sins once for all. The just for the unjust so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. We love that text. We love this idea of the understanding that Christ was the final sacrifice for us once for all. This is echoes of those so many other places in the Scripture where we see this idea of Christ's sacrifice for my sins. And just in case we have any concern, the just, the only just in this verse is Christ. And we are the unjust. Once for all, that God made a way to have a Savior who died and could save us to pay the penalty for our sins. And he was put to death and he was made alive. If the passage ended at 18, it would be very easy to understand But then we come to this next portion here of what is the, what is going on. It says, in which he also, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. Which is a few that is in which a few that is eight persons were brought safely through the water. <clears throat> Many have wondered, well, is this talking about like the preaching of the gospel to those who are dead, to the spirits in prison in hell? And Just what is going on with this idea? And yet, when we begin to look at this context and this idea of a timeless gospel, as we begin to look deeper into this idea that in many ways, The Lord is not bringing up here in Peter some new idea or something that's not really in other portions of Scripture. That there's somehow a preaching and a way of coming to Christ or hearing preaching after death. We can see that he doesn't truly mean that because if that were the case, he wouldn't have said only that he's going to preach to people from one period of time. So he's not speaking of preaching to the dead. But what he's beginning to show here is the timelessness of the gospel. Because there were so many, especially in this time, before the... before in the um, those who knew and saw Christ coming. And there's a question at some points in time, is this a different gospel that you have? In fact, many have begun to split and divide the Scripture. 
in ways to take and say there's a gospel that happened in the Old Testament, there's a gospel that happened in the New Testament. What we're beginning to see here is there is the same gospel that is preached even in the earlier period of time. Christ was preached in the days of Noah. It was preached that these people who were wicked, <clears throat> rejecting God, needed a salvation to escape the judgment that was coming. And again, we see, even if we were to turn over to Second Peter chapter 5, that this is a vision and an understanding that um, Peter places very much in his, um, in his ideas. When he talks about, in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says, he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought about a flood upon the world of the ungodly. We don't really think about this oftentimes in the story of Noah, but he was there for over a hundred years, preaching to the to those who were in a bondage. And in the same way that we cannot preach Christ now without knowing him, without having his spirit inside of us, Christ, who didn't begin at Bethlehem, but has been from the beginning of the world, was there empowering and with Noah at that time. And he keeps on te and that there was great preaching there. A hundred years. And it's interesting, out of all those who were alive at that time, thousands and hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, it says only eight were saved. Everyone else of that time was destroyed in judgment, and yet there was there was the preaching that they heard through that time. And I don't know how it is, how it was, but I can certainly imagine that time period. Can you imagine being the only one preaching righteousness in the entire world for more than a hundred years and seeing no fruit whatsoever? Most likely being mocked and put in difficult situations, interfered with. Who knows, maybe that's why it took 120 years to take and build the ark. We don't know. But even there, Christ was preached. And it's interesting that this passage does come after this last section where we're being told to suffer well. To suffer well for righteousness. It's almost as if <clears throat> the apostle and the Lord through the apostle is taking it and saying, Look, I just told you to suffer well, to suffer for doing right. right. And you know what? Christ died and suffered for you. And this message, this gospel that you have, has been preached from the beginning even through times when it was more difficult than the time that you were in. We always begin to think to ourselves that we have the most difficult time to spread the gospel, that the gospel is 
more um, out of fashion disregarded in our time than any other. We are in this position and we begin to see that the this idea of no, the gospel, the need of a savior, and the fact that the Lord is providing salvation has been preached from the very beginning through his people. And in many times in places much more difficult than we have exist than we have experienced or ever could hope to experience. <clears throat> Even if we were to think about that time of the preaching of righteousness during the time of Noah, we have more in this room than he had in the entire world. And if the Lord saved and preserved Noah and his family, then certainly he could save us and continue for us in this time. <clears throat> He preserves his people, those who preach, teach, suffer for his gospel, regardless throughout all time. But it's interesting that he begins to take and dive even more into this idea of the gospel. So it talks about the eight persons were brought safely through the water. It's interesting, the, through this time of being on that ark, which would have been the salvation of that time, moving, rocking, all these things, hearing the rain outside on that ark, knowing that everything outside of where they were was under the judgment of the Lord, but he had taken and given them a way of escape, a way of salvation. And that they had heard it, that they knew it, and they had chosen to follow it. Because it's interesting even after the ark was built, Noah and his family had to choose to leave everything that they were and to get on into that ark and to move along. See, the gospel always has required those who hear it to make a positive decision to follow him, to follow the Lord. Even in its great timelessness, these are timeless truths of what the gospel is. No matter in what time they have been tr true for thousands of years, and they will be true throughout and until the end of time. As we see in verse 21, we begin to see <clears throat> the apostle drawing in a correlation to baptism and this idea. <clears throat> now, it's interesting that out of this passage, I said we had at least one difficult passage at the beginning, and beginning in verse 9, and verse 21 begins a different one. Because some will say, well, how are you saved? You're saved by being baptized. If you've been baptized, you're saved. <clears throat> or you need baptism for salvation. But there's a very quick 
caveat here. It says, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, which is the actual act of baptism, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ. You have to remember at this time, especially for Jewish believers, but even so many times for others, you could be left alone and been rather comfortable and safe if you were Jewish. Judaism was a religion that was legal and safe. But especially as persecution became greater and greater, once you went through baptism and the resurrection and the understanding of saying, this is how I am identifying with Christ, I am placing my faith in him, not in anything else, you would be cast out of that safety, if you will, of being able to say, well, I'm just a weird sect of Judaism, but I'm still within that. So, especially in the early church, this is why they talked about baptism, why they did baptism shortly after they were became saved, but they always did it was because this is the way that they could say, in a sense, I am getting on the ark of Christ. I am placing my faith in him. And I'm going to do this act and show everyone that my faith is in God, not in anything else. And the resurrection of Christ. They had to place their faith that the Lord would bring them through. So does baptism fit? save? No, it doesn't. Is it an amazing picture? And a picture that runs through the whole of the Scripture of taking everything that you are and placing your faith in something new, in the salvation of God, in the resurrection of Christ Yes, it is. And for these individuals at this time, that was how they could see that they were truly placing their faith out. For many, that was the time when their suffering began as they began to publicly proclaim their faith in Christ was at that point, and that's why we see it here. We see this timeless gospel that hasn't changed in its essentials from the very beginning. The reality of sin and our need for a Savior has been the message of God's people from the very beginning. the knowledge and the understanding. That he will provide salvation from something that we cannot do on our own. No matter if it looks different from age to age, from time to time. That is always the message of the Scripture. Again, hard for us because we are in time, and but the Lord is not bound by time. That is why this gospel can be timeless. The only reason why the ways and means of we, that we see the Lord working with his people is different from time to time is because we are contained in time. We have to either look 
as they did in the Old Testament and before, look forward to what was happening or for us to look backwards to what was happening. But it is the same gospel of salvation for sin that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're going to run out of time to complete this passage, but it's this timeless gospel that begins to take in work in the lives of his people. In beginning in chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, because it's a therefore. Because this gospel is here, because Christ died and suffered in the flesh, it will take and cause changes in us as we reach out and accept that gospel. To put it in the broadest brush possible for the sake of time today, and we'll take and dive into it more next week. It is placing us in a position where we are dead to sin and alive to Christ, alive to the Spirit. <clears throat> a place where those things that we do are changed, and it's odd, truly an oddity that comes. And it provides a whole new realm for us to understand service. Now, again, those are the broadest possible strokes of chapter 4. But again, I won't keep us here for that. But it's important that we think about this today because unless we understand the gospel, we can't understand how it changes us as we accept it. And the need for this decision in our own in our own lives and hearts and minds to come into this relationship to have faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his death and resurrection for us. As we see it, the time of choosing and decision-making comes for us. The choice has always been the same. Shall we trust in the Lord, in his desire, or I should say in his plan and provision for sin, or are we trusting in anything else? And are we making that decision public and real in our lives. Doesn't mean that you have to be baptized, but again, if that were true, we'd Lord willing be baptizing all the time. Many times we wait and we do it once we have a service once a year. But it is a time where we have that commitment and that we're willing to make it not merely a matter of private conviction. It's interesting how in our world, 
All of these things are meant to be matters of private conviction. And yet our choice, decision, and understanding to follow Christ is to be a point of public declaration. There are no secret believers. Or certainly, there should not be secret service agents of Christ in that way. We are an above-ground service for Him. And that will mean that we will suffer the consequences of being in His service. But He's already gone before us in that. Suffered more than we could ever think, plan, or believe. And our service in spite of the difficulties is where we begin to truly place again our trust in him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for a gospel, a good news that is the same yesterday, today, and forever that even though we are fired and caught up in sin and shame, that you are the Savior, and that you have called us to come and to place our lives, our hopes, our everything, before you. Not in secret or clandestinely, Lord, but that we would live for you. Acknowledging you and accepting the consequences. Lord, I just pray that you would take and help us each and every one to live our lives for you and you alone. Jesus' name, amen. We are dismissed.